Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, as many of you know, I am off to the Shiloh battlefield in just about a week and a half. Going to be spending several days there and we are doing a meetup uh, at the Shiloh battlefield and I put the details of that in an announcement I did about a week ago. I will put that back up at the end of this video if you haven't already seen that or I'll put it in the link in the description as well. So you can check that out to get the details about when and where you can meet with me and have dinner with me if you'd like to afterwards uh, here in just a couple of weeks at the Shiloh battlefield. Also going to be heading to Gettysburg unexpectedly to be with some pretty big names in the Civil War history realm. Uh, more details to follow about that in the coming weeks. Uh, but I wanted to go back to the channel Warhawk because as I'm building up to visiting the Shiloh battlefield, I'm going to be talking about some of the events that unfolded in the times leading up to the Battle of Shiloh, how it came about in the first place. And that means talking about Fort Donelson, the place where General Grant earned his nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant. So we're going to be visiting the channel Warhawk because I don't think there's anybody who does it better when it comes to showing you the details on the ground of exactly what happened in a battle using maps and animations. And that reminded me that I actually got to spend some time with one of the guys from Warhawk and I never shared that video with you. So before we get into this video today, I want to share a clip I shot when we were back at Antietam last fall. What's up everybody? I am on Burnside Bridge here at Antietam and I've got a friend with me today. Hey there. Hey, it's Jonathan and he is from the channel Warhawk, which I know you guys are familiar with. If you're not, shame on you. Go subscribe right now. I'll put a link in the description. Fantastic channel if, like me, you love to nerd out on Civil War battlefields and all the little minutia and, and details and what regiment was where and when. Jonathan's one of the reasons why we have that channel, so go check them out. So as always, the link is in the description to the original video here from Warhawk. Before we dive in, I want to share one other thing with you. I have a friend. His name is James Early, and he is a professor of history down in Texas. And he's got a series of fantastic podcasts. But in particular, I want to point you to his uh, podcast on key battles of the American Civil War, uh, where he talks about among others, the Battle of Shiloh. It would be a great listen if you want to learn more about the battle uh, before uh, I start diving into content from the ground there. So I'll put a link uh, to where you can find that podcast, but you can find it on any podcast platform that you use. It's called Key Battles of the American Civil War. His name's James Early, and you can look for his Key Battles of other wars as well. He's got the Revolution, World War I, uh, things like that. So check those things out. On the evening of February 11, 1862, Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant holds a council of war meeting with his generals, all but one of whom support his plans for an overland attack on Fort Donelson. The only general who objects with reservations about the plan is Brigadier General John A. McClernand. The next day, Grant's expeditionary command begins moving out from its staging area at the recently subjugated Fort Henry. So Fort Henry basically could have been taken without doing anything because it actually sits. First, let's talk about this. So we've got two rivers, the Tennessee and the Cumberland River, who which are um, running alongside each other. And on the insides, on the land side of both of them is Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. And those forts are guarding those rivers because they know that those rivers are key strategic points. And in the case of Fort Donelson, Fort Donelson is protecting a river that runs down to Nashville. And if the Union Navy can get their boats past Fort Donelson, they can go to Nashville. And so the Confederacy knows that if they lose Fort Donelson, they can't hold Nashville. That's one of the reasons why it's key. But Fort Henry is super low uh, in terms of its elevation, and it's right along the river. And the river actually floods and ends up flooding a lot of Fort Henry. Fort Henry really, neither one of these are really traditional forts in the sense that like a Fort Sumter is with walls and parapets and all that sort of thing. It's really more of a kind of a strung together fortifications that are um, just kind of dug in and gun emplacements and uh, just really more of a, uh, 
a battlefield fortification type of thing rather than an actual like brick and mortar fort. March. And I should mention too, McClernand, you'll hear me talk about him a lot uh, in other videos. McClernand is a political appointee general. He's a, a war Democrat. He's got friendship with Lincoln, which is one of the only reasons he's in the position he is. And he will undermine Grant at every opportunity he gets until Grant finally has an excuse to fire him during the Vicksburg campaign. Marching east over land towards Fort Donelson. Meanwhile, Flag Officer Andrew H. Foote begins maneuvering his western flotilla into the Cumberland River for a naval bombardment of the Confederate fort. So what's great about this is that this is one of the most effective uses that we will see uh, of the Army and the Navy working together. And Foote is called Flag Officer because they don't actually have the rank of admiral yet but the flag officer rank is basically an admiral and it's during the civil war they're going to create the rank of admiral uh, but grant and foot work beautifully together and grants under the direct command of henry halleck who commands the western departments and grant has one of the kind of the sub departments under halleck and he and foot have to like really push halleck to get permission to finally move on fort donelson however unlike fort henry Donaldson will prove to be a tough nut for the Federals to crack. The Union columns begin marching via the Ridge and Telegraph Roads on the morning of February 12th, now occupied by mild weather and quickly drying roads. Brigadier Generals McClernand and Smith sets out with their commands. Now Smith is a guy that actually Grant had served under at one point, and so there was concern by Smith that he was that it was going to be an awkward situation. Or there was a concern by Grant that it was going to be an awkward situation with Smith serving under Grant. But Smith was totally cool, and he actually made the situation very comfortable for Grant under circumstances. And he's actually going to die before too long uh, from illness. Even Brigadier General Lew Wallace and 2,500 men to guard the federal base at Fort Henry. The way to Fort Donaldson and the nearby town of Dover lay over steep hills and deep ravines, but in an air of gaiety pervades the march as it seems like a picture book war in Dixie. Soldiers ditch their excess overcoats and blankets. Nowhere do the Confederates seem to impede the Union troops' advance. It's February. Now granted, it's Tennessee, so it's a little different weather than, say, here in Ohio, in parts of the north but it does still sometimes get very cold there in february and these guys are ditching all their stuff because they're marching and they're sweating and they're warm and they're going to desperately want that stuff in a couple of days at the same time that grant is marching his command over land foot and his gunboats are escorting troop transports carrying reinforcements up the cumberland the uss carondelet precedes the waterborne column with orders to announce its arrival to Grant by firing a few shells at Fort Donelson. By the evening of the 12th, Grant's land force has moved virtually unopposed to the outskirts of Confederate positions surrounding Dover. Suddenly, General McClernand's cavalry patrols run into resistance about a mile from the rebel defenses, when troopers under the rugged but as yet unsung Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest sets up a roadblock arrival of so Forrest is a really wealthy guy he initially enlists as a private in the confederate army but like a lot of men who are wealthy he's going to use his resources and his connections to raise troops and at this time in history you raise troops you get to command those troops in many cases uh, so that's why you're going to see Forrest rise all the way from private to lieutenant general by the end of the war partially because of his wealth and his connections but then once he gets to this point, it's because of his skill on the battlefield. Of Union infantry soon forces the gray-clad horsemen back into the Confederate perimeter. Remembering Pelo's ineptitude during the Mexican War, Grant had boasted that he would march to Fort Donelson unopposed. The Tennessee politician turned general was absent at the moment, having gone to Cumberland City to argue with Brigadier General John B. Floyd for standing firm at the fort. But he had left Brigadier General Simon B. Buckner in charge with orders to avoid pitched battle. The Kentucky. So let's talk real quick about this chain of command, right? So you've got Floyd and Pillow. Uh, Floyd 
before the war is the Secretary of War under James Buchanan. So like a year before this, he was in the cabinet of the United States government. And while he was Secretary of War, as the buildup is happening toward uh, civil war, after these uh, other states have seceded, Floyd starts using his role as Secretary of War to divert supplies and ammunition and weapons into southern armories and forts, knowing that in the event of war, now all of this stuff's going to be in the South where it can easily be confiscated. And because he knows that, he's going to come to the decision that he cannot, under any circumstances, be captured when Grant lays siege to this fort. Duckian does so, and the Union besiegers arrive without much difficulty. Slowly, General Smith and McClernand take up positions to carry out Grant's plan. They will surround the fort and wait for Foote and his gunboats to repeat their easy victory at Fort Henry. The Union Navy could batter the Confederates into submission. In General Grant's view, this will save time and lives. And there's plenty of reason to think that. The Navy had been essential in them taking uh, Fort Henry. The Navy very easily takes the city of New Orleans, which is by far the largest city in the Confederacy. The Navy is blockading southern ports. The Confederacy really doesn't have an answer for any of that. And I should mention, too, that at this point, February 1862, the Union hasn't captured New Orleans yet, but they're going to within a couple of months. As the Army commander and his staff set up headquarters at the Widow Crisp's cabin on a slope along the eastern bank of Hickman Creek behind Smith's line, the rattle of musketry suddenly cuts through the otherwise calm winter evening to announce the first contact between the two armies. The stage is set when the USS Carondelet briefly announces the Union Navy's presence on the Cumberland River. So one of the things you'll notice if you're looking at the regiments involved here, right? Texas, Kentucky, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina troops uh, or Maryland here in the West because th this is the West. And it's the same thing in the Union Army. You're not going to see many like Pennsylvania, New York, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island regiments, uh, New Jersey in these armies in the West. You're going to see a lot of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, places like that. Slowly, Smith's soldiers edge up a ridge closer to the rifle pits held by Buckner's division closest to the fort. McClernand's soldiers begin to march toward the right to reach the river above the town. With darkness descending over Fort Donelson, however, and lacking complete information on the situation, Grant's army soon settles down to await daylight when they can complete their encirclement of the Confederate force. That night, the Federals peer across the intervening ravines at the luminous campfires in the Confederates' armed camp beyond the earthworks. The Southerners are backed up against the Cumberland with avenues of escape fast disappearing. But the Rebs have come here to fight, not run. And down at the river, Lieutenant Colonel Milton Haney's keeps his water battery gunners at work, if only to boost morale for facing the dreaded Yankee gunboats the next day. On the river itself, two remaining steamboats left to Confederate service shuttle Floyd's Virginians in from Cumberland City amid flaming torches and cheering from the shoreline. When General Floyd arrives in person at dawn on Thursday, February 13th, he sets up headquarters in a picturesque hotel in Dover. So now you've got some reinforcements coming in from Virginia. Virginia and North Carolina are by far going to supply the most troops to the Confederacy and also suffer the most casualties. So so you do have units from some eastern places. You're just not going to see them very often. And a lot of times they're going to bounce back and forth. So Longstreet, for example, is going to fight with his corps in 1863, 62, 63 in the east. But then he's going to come west and fight at Chickamauga with many of his troops. Near the upper steamboat landing and assesses the situation. Two sharp infantry attacks and a naval bombardment marked the first day of fighting at the Battle of Fort Donelson. 
So you look at this situation as it exists at this moment, and if you're the Confederates, you're actually in a pretty good position at the moment, right? There's only a couple of brigades here that are facing the Confederate army. And so you're entrenched, you have a good, strong defensive position, and really you probably got more men on the field. Uh, the problem is you let yourself get bottled in and you wait too long to try and break out. And by then the Union's got more men. February 13th. This is seen as a test of Confederate strength and defenses, but not a pitched battle. All three of the actions begin in the morning and continue into the afternoon set against a backdrop of continuous and crackling sharpshooter fire and occasional artillery burst. General Smith and McClernand are to demonstrate but not attack the enemy. They almost immediately ignore these orders from Grant. Which is going to be a theme for McClernand especially. He always thinks he's going to know best and that he should be in command instead of Grant. He's going to undermine him to the point where at one point he actually gets at least for a while, permission to raise his own corps to do his own thing uh, in the West uh, as far as Vicksburg is concerned. But then uh, Grant's going to appeal to Lincoln, and Lincoln's going to say, no, listen, Grant's the department commander. You're under his command, McClernand, and uh, McClernand's just going to finally go too far. The Army commander has also instructed Commander Henry Walk and the USS Carondelet to make a diversionary bombardment of the fort to enable the land forces to complete their encirclement. Walk draws heavy fire from Haney's water battery gunners without accomplishing much, but as the soldiers slang of the day would have it, the ball was opened. As it turns out, the main land fights are of greatest interest to the Federals, since they indicate that Fort Donelson's investments might be more difficult than anticipated. The initial fight on February 13th begins on Brigadier General C.F. Smith's front as the 2nd Division tries to move closer to General Buckner's position on the Eddyville Road sector. No one has decent maps, and to uncover Confederate battery positions, Smith directs Battery D, 1st Missouri Artillery, to shell the rebel defenses. Then, after a hearty breakfast, the white-haired brigadier orders a simultaneous advance of Colonel John Cook's 3rd Brigade and Colonel Jacob G. Lawman's 4th Brigade. So John Cook is kind of an interesting fellow because this is really kind of his last campaign in the American Civil War. After this, he's going to be sent west and given a, uh, I think his name was John Pope Cook. Um, and as far as I know, no close relation to all the other, or the, I'm sorry, those are McCooks from Ohio. Um, but Cook is going to be sent west, given a department in like Iowa or something. He, he fights against the Sioux Indians. A lot of people don't realize that while the American Civil War is going on, uh, the Union is also dealing with stuff out west in places like Minnesota and Iowa and on the frontier, dealing with Native American issues that are going to come to define the next couple of decades. And I believe Cook is buried in the same cemetery as Abraham Lincoln in Illinois. Out marches the enthusiastic Northerners in battle array, a clear violation of General Grant's orders not to bring on a major battle. A hot fire from the Southern defenders in the entrenchments also disorganizes Smith's movement. By late afternoon, Lawman and Cook have successfully extricated their men with a nasty firefight, leaving nearly a hundred dead comrades on the hillside before Buckner's earthworks. The thrill of first battle is muted for both sides by sights and sounds of first casualties. Even So he says the thrill of first battle. Remember that this is early in the war. There has not been a major battle in the West. Grant has fought a small battle at Belmont in Missouri. Um, there have been some skirmishes here and there, uh, but there wasn't really a battle at Fort, Don Fort Henry. Uh, this is really the first combat for a lot of these men. Then Commander Walk's Coran delay and the water batteries suffer losses as a prominent Confederate gun captain is cut down by a screw tap loosened by the explosion of a Union shell, and one 128-pounder Confederate projectile knives through the gunboat's side, skipping about like a wild animal, wounding several seamen with wood splinters and bursting a steam heater before dropping, still hissing, over the side of the ship and into the water. Young gunboat crewmen learn quickly that the ironclads offer no safe haven from the danger. Out so in a lot of these forts, and you, you see this when you go to Vicksburg as well, they have these pits where they 
would make these fires because they would use heated shells. Uh, if you're familiar with like World War II, you know that uh, the armor piercing shells that they would use to take out tanks would would often be superheated because it would kind of it would help them cut through the steel. And a lot of times in movies you see like the the ring that's kind of heated and smoke coming out from where the armor piercing shell went in. Same concept here is that a lot of times when you're dealing with naval vessels, you're going to use these heated shells that you heat up and and these forts that are kind of in one place are able to build the facilities to do these heated shells. Out in the woods, the redoubtable Nathan Bedford Force just beginning to earn fame as one of the finest and toughest cavalry officers of the war draws blood. Annoyed by one pesky marksman from the famed Burgess's Western Sharpshooters, he has borrowed a Maynard rifle from one of his officers and shot the offender out of a tree. This young sharpshooter would be the first of many Yankees killed by Forrest in the war. And Forrest, yeah, I was going to say, he's one of those guys that even though he's going to rise to lieutenant general, probably for high-ranking officers, probably killed more men during the war than anybody else. Also had a bunch of horses shot out from under him. Artillery fire also sounds that morning in McClernand's sector as his men undertake to march around Dover by the Wind Ferries and Pyrenees Roads. Illinois cavalrymen first catch sight of the Cumberland as they mount Dudley's Hill, and they quickly draw fire from the Confederate entrenchments and artillery positions in that sector. So you notice all of these units are Illinois units. One of the things that's happening is even while Fort Donelson is being surrounded by the Union, the Union is still assembling its army. Lew Wallace's division, which he's got some men back at Fort Henry, and eventually he's going to arrive at Fort Donelson. Donelson or Wallace's division is just being formed. A lot of these guys are like getting off of trains, arriving from their home states, and being thrown right into... Fort Donaldson. Uh, my ancestor with the 20th Ohio is a perfect example of that. They're in Lou Wallace's division. They're going to arrive in Tennessee just in time to march on Fort Donaldson. One especially Nettleson battery, Captain Frank Manley's Tennessee battery from Humphrey County, peppers McClernand's marching Federals with long-range fire. General McClernand determines to put an end to this impertinence. In defiance of Grant's instructions, once again, he sends a brigade crashing through the debris-clogged ravines against the main Confederate position in an attempt to silence the offending guns. So early, you might be thinking, well, man, how are these guys getting away with defying orders so much? Number one, Grant's not present on the field to even really know what's going on. He's uh, you know, because he's working with the Navy, he's kind of coordinating things, he's still bringing the Army in, so he's out, he's got a lot of uh, kind of uh, irons in the fire at one time. But also, remember, this is early in the war, you got a lot of political appointees, you got a lot of people that are new to position because these are new units that are being formed. Later on in the war, you'll have a lot of those insubordinate political type generals weeded out or put in assignments where they're not in position to do stuff like that. Uh, so that's why you don't see it happen a lot later in the war, because by then the cream has risen to the top, so to speak. But right now you're still dealing with a lot of that. Colonel William R. Morrison's 3rd Brigade makes the assault under the personal leadership of Colonel Isham N. Haney of the 48th Illinois, sweeping down from the Wind Ferry Road into Aaron Hollow in Parade Ground Formation. The fight ends in 15 minutes. As with General Smith's reconnaissance in force, abity, accurate enemy fire, and poorly disciplined attackers in unfavorable terrain cuts the Haney Morrison attack to ribbons. Another 150 Federal dead litter the hillside near the offending battery's position, but here, dry leaves catch fire during the fighting and threaten a cruel death to the wounded attackers. When the shooting ceases, humane Confederates leap from behind their works and rush out into no man's land to rescue their hmm. erstwhile enemies. Minutes later, the two sides are once again back to shooting one another. Should have kept your stuff. And a lot of this is on the officers for not making sure that these guys didn't just cast all their blankets and heavy winter clothes and stuff like that aside. They should have known that the weather was not going to remain warm and that they were going to want that stuff back. Both sides expect to see the gunboats attack Fort Donaldson, 
for Grant has great faith that his friend Foote can win another striking victory as he had done at Fort Henry. Nevertheless, the flag officer is hesitant as a result of the punishment his flotilla had suffered in the earlier battle. So Grant orders Brigadier General Lew Wallace to bring reinforcements overland from the Tennessee River Post and forms them into a third division, positioned between Smith and McClernand to cover the Indian Creek Valley sector. Grant's command is now approaching 21,000 men surrounding Dover as he waits impatiently for the gunboats to do something. So he still barely outnumbers the Confederates at this point, because I think they've got around that number of men as well. Overnight, temperatures plummet to 12 degrees Fahrenheit, and cold winds whip snow, sleet, and freezing rain against the soldiers huddled on both sides of the lines. Fires are forbidden for fear they will disclose positions to the enemy. Many young Union volunteers wish they had not so quickly discarded blankets and overcoats on the march from Fort Henry. Few units in either army are as blessed as Confederate Colonel Roger Hansen's 2nd Kentucky of Brigadier General Buckner's right wing with their hooded parkas. Many of the southern comrades have to wrap themselves in old quilts and blankets and even cut up pieces of carpet to guard against the brutal weather. Hmm. It was a night of great suffering and hardship, recalled one Union Brigade commander. Neither army is especially ready to fight when a cold dawn emerges on Valentine's Day, February 14th. But Grant is up early and looking for action. He and his staff ride to the river at about 9 a.m. to consult with Foote aboard his flagship. Grant directs the newly arrived troops aboard the transport to leave their comfortable quarters and join the shivering soldiers surrounding Fort Donelson. Then he turns to Foote and persuades him that the gunboats might simply run by the water batteries and enfilade the rebel positions. The this won't be the last time that he has a suggestion to the Navy to run past uh, fortified batteries. He's going to have the same thing happen eventually at Vicksburg. Us forcing surrender. Foote wants to await the arrival of flatboats carrying heavy mortars to subdue the fort. Grant says no, declaring that the army needs support and that it is time to finish their work. The grumbling flag officer calls his boat captains together, gives them instructions about preparing for combat, and then turns to his battle plan. This is a really, I mentioned it already, a really understated part of Grant's success in the West is his ability to work with the Navy and, and, and the ability for the Navy, because listen, they're not, like Foote is under no obligation to obey Grant, but they recognize that they both want the same thing and they're gonna coordinate and work together. And it's gonna become essential for that. They will proceed as they had done at Fort Henry. The Confederate gunners, meanwhile, had remained at their guns at that frigid night, anticipating an advance by the gunboats under the cover of a stormy darkness. Occasionally, they fire a shot down the river just to annoy Foote's flotilla and the transports. Early on St. Valentine's Day, Captain Reuben Ross in the upper battery spots a large plum of smoke indicating something is afoot. He sends word afoot. to Floyd's headquarters, but the Confederate generals are busy with other matters, as Flood indicates in a telegram to General Johnston claiming he now faces 40,000 Yankees. I will fight them this evening. Indeed, Floyd, Pillow, and Buckner intend a surprise foray to break the land siege. It takes time to muster the troops in position and, at the pivotal moment for the breakout attempt, the gunboats hover into view on the river. Hmm. Flag Officer Foote's flotilla comes around a bend in a river at about 2 p.m. on February 14th, steaming against a flood tide of the muddy river. It takes a half hour to close with the water batteries. The City Series ironclads USS St. Louis, Louisville, Pittsburgh, and Carondelet lead the van. See, this is one of the things that I always find fascinating. They've got these ironclads that they're using in the West, right? Uh, the 
everybody talks about the first action involving ironclads in the American Civil War being the Monitor and the Virginia, or the Monitor and the Merrimack, as it's sometimes called. And the reason for that, by the way, is that it was the USS Merrimack. It was sunk. The Confederates got it, raised it up, and then put the iron hull around it. So a lot of people still referred to it as the Merrimack, even though the Confederates renamed it the CSS Virginia. But uh, that all happens after... These gunboats, these ironclad gunboats, have already been involved in combat on the rivers in the west. They've been abreast as at Fort Henry. Then come September clads, USS Tyler and Conestoga, about Conestoga. one quarter mile in the rear. Meanwhile, Captain Ross sends some shots toward the Union transports, scattering them after they had landed their human cargoes. He then turns his battery on the gunboats, which had opened fire about one and one half miles from the batteries. As the craft moves to point-blank range, they suffer cruel punishment from Ross and his heavy guns. The rebel gunners have carefully plotted ranges by marking on trees along the riverbank, and they have devised special sighting devices on their cannons. Floodwaters had already swept a barricade of floating trees some 900 yards from the batteries. It is up to the water batteries to save the day on their own. The naval action at Fort Donelson assumes a different cast from that at Fort Henry as foot closes to within 450 yards of the batteries shortly after mid-afternoon. These batteries are more elevated above the water than Fort Henry's row of guns, and the plunging fire from the two water batteries at Fort Donelson soon finds the gunboat's vulnerability. Why does that matter? Because if you're low to the ground and you're even with the gunboats, you're hitting their ironclad hulls, right? Their most protected parts. The plunging fire going down on top of them is going to get past, you know, they're not heavily ironclad on top. They rake the craft fore and aft with shot and shell. Before long, all but the gunboat Carondelet are drifting back downstream in defeat. During the artillery exchange, Flag Officer Foote is wounded, ironically, in the foot. His flagship, USS St. Louis, has been reduced to shambles during the exchange. Shivering Confederates all over Fort Donaldson's perimeter take up cries of victory. Hmm. They had not expected to beat the gunboats as, at one point, an excited Nathan Bedford Forrest shouted to an aide, Parson, for God's sake, pray. Nothing but Almighty God can save that fort. The inexperienced Confederate gunners have achieved an astonishing 50% hit record on the gunboats. The humiliated naval officer counts 54 dead or dying mm. among his severely battered craft. As another harsh winter night settles over the gloomy Union besiegers, they listen to the celebrations across the Confederate lines. It is the Confederacy's greatest triumph at Fort Donelson, and Grant is anything but sanguine about prospects for a quick victory. He will let the Navy make its own excuses for defeat. But he writes to his wife, Julia, that night that the taking of Fort Donelson bids fair to be a long job. The moment of decision had arrived for the Confederacy in the West. Announcement of the Confederate triumph flashes over telegraph wires to Johnston, countering earlier predictions of a dire defeat at the hands of the dreaded gunboats. So Johnston is in command out West. Uh, he's one of the few people on either side, who was a general before the war. Um, he had served as a general in the Army for Te of Texas back in the 1830s. Uh, and he's actually got uh, a wound in his leg from a duel that he fought while he was a general in Texas. And it, some, some people argue that that wound uh, had nerve damage, and that was why he didn't feel the bullet that hit him at the Battle of Shiloh that ultimately, ultimately would cost his life. Uh, but Johnston's not in a position... Uh, to be able to march up with an army and relieve Fort Donelson. They don't have that kind of time, and he's nowhere near in that position. Uh, but he is going to gather an army and come after Grant in the following months, which is going to lead to the Battle of Shiloh. Johnston wires back to Floyd. If you lose the fort, bring your troops to Nashville if possible. Why does that matter? Because as soon as Fort Donelson falls, the river is open to Nashville. But with victory seemingly in their grasp, the brigadiers hesitate about their next step. General Floyd convenes a council of war at which the participants determine whether to continue the battle or fight their way out of the federal trap. Pillow wants to remain, 
Floyd and Buckner prefer to get out under the cover of a surprise attack the next morning. Ironic that Pillow wants to remain, and yet he's one of the people who's going to get out of there before the surrender. Details of the scheme are murky. Pillow understands that when the avenue of escape opens, the troops would return to the rifle pits to secure baggage, artillery, rations, the water battery gunners, and other troops. On the other hand, Buckner thinks that the attackers will keep going once they had breached the Union lines. There would be no turning back. Gunners, supplies, and excess personnel would be left to their fate, with nothing truly resolved except that they would attack in the morning. Brigadier General Bushra Johnson, for one, departs the meeting gloomier and more anxious than before. I think Bushra Johnson, by the way, is from Ohio. He's, he's one of these rare, like, northern guys who fights in the Confederate Army. Yeah, was it, though? Just as Foote's appearance has disrupted Confederate plans that afternoon, the unexpected victory at the water batteries confuses the Southern generals as to the urgency of leaving or fighting on. At any rate, the troops gather for the massive Confederate assault scheduled for daybreak on Saturday, February 15th. Lumbering into position during the winter night, snow and wind muffles the sounds of movement. None of the Federals detect the shifting columns. Buckner's men withdraw from their entrenchments, leaving only a single regiment of 450 men armed with shotguns to face Smith's whole division. That's crazy. Delays prove inevitable. However, as weary soldiers navigate slick roads, Buckner's force is still not in position when Generals Pello and Johnson start their attack at 6 a.m. on February 15th. McClernand's cold and sleepy soldiers stumble out of their makeshift bivouacs as the first warning shots and sounds of the infamous rebel yell break the cold morning air. The big push to flee starvation, Yankee prison camps, and the stigma of surrender has begun. General Pello would style it the Battle of Dover. The snow, underbrush, and tactical inexperience further delays any quick resolution. The fighting turns into a slugfest between the Confederates' heavy attack columns and McClernand's thin line of defenders in the vicinity of the Forge and Wind Ferry Roads. At 8 a.m., however, the Federals are in trouble as fighting envelops the country lanes and ravines and bloodstained snow mark points of contact between the two battle lines. Forrest's cavalry troopers dislodge a stubborn Union field battery and the Confederate infantry slowly bend McClernand's 1st Division back under heavy pressure. So I should say, uh, in all my criticism of McClernand, McClernand is not a completely incompetent general. He's insubordinate. He's severely insubordinate. And he's ambitious and he's a politician, so he doesn't have the military training that people from West Point like Grant have. Uh, that doesn't mean he's completely worthless and incompetent. And in this situation, he does pretty well. Uh, and Grant is not around, at least early on when this fighting is happening. As the young Union soldiers expend their ammunition, they simply drop out of line, holding their empty cartridge boxes aloft and begin a slowly withdrawal. McClernand sends couriers to Lew Wallace's command post for help, but the Indiana general hesitates to act without Grant's instructions. Somehow, the Army commander has disappeared. Earlier that morning, Grant had ridden once more with the wounded and humbled foot aboard his gunboat. Headquarter aides do not know what to do in their leader's absence, and the intervening woods hide the sounds of the unfolding battle from the command conferences at the river. So it's important to say, you guys know I love Grant, but let's point out criticism where it's due. The same thing will, will happen again at Shiloh. Um, Grant while he has maneuvered the army well and he's coordinating well with the navy there are certain blind spots he tends to have and typically it resolves around being prepared when there's not a lot going on uh, at shiloh he doesn't have his men digging in and, and properly prepared for the possibility of an attack by the confederates as he's gathering his army to march on corinth uh, here he goes off to meet with foot but he doesn't leave someone in command in his absence. He, he leaves instructions not to bring on a general engagement, but that 
only works for the Union. That doesn't work for, well, what if the Confederates attack you? It means he just didn't think the Confederates were going to do this. And so he didn't leave instructions as to what to do. And so Grant is re responsible for this. Thus, by noon, Pillow and Johnson have carried Confederate fortunes to the brink of success. Avidly, federal defeat was caused mostly by fatigue, supply shortages, and inept defensive moves, not by any lack of pluck or valor. Nonetheless, McClernand's division had been beaten back from its position. The attackers are unable to finish their task. By early afternoon, the relentless drive of Pillow and Johnson, now supported by Buckner, had gained the objective. The Federals had been driven back from the Forge Road and westward along the Winds Ferry Road toward Fort Henry. Two of McClernand's three front-line brigades had been crumpled, and the third is being forced into precipitous retreat. So if you're the Confederates now, right, go! Get out of there while you can, right? I know you've been fighting, I know you're tired, but your whole point is to break out. Now you've, you've broken out, now get out of there. Maybe they just couldn't withdraw. I mean, maybe the situation on the ground is such that it's not as easy as it looks to do that. Still, another brigade is crushed as it rushes from reserve. At that hour, the way out of the Fort Donaldson trap is open to the Confederates. Stretched along a mile-long battle line, the soldiers are ready, their leaders are not. During the subsequent two hours, the Confederate generals yield the initiative back to the enemy. Yeah, he's still Brigadier General at this point. He'll get promoted before Shiloh. A combination of circumstances snatches defeat from victory. General Wallace has finally taken the initiative and moves to a blocking position astride the Winds Ferry Road, where he stymies the Confederate attack. The rebel attackers run out of momentum, and General Pello, according to his interpretation of the original plan, now orders everyone back to the trenches preparatory to evacuation. He also notices signs of a federal attack on Buckner's weakly held position in the distance. Buckner, however, raises strong objection and questions Pillow's authority to change the plan. Hmm. The two generals haggle while their soldiers mill around waiting for further orders. Yeah, so Floyd's the guy in command here, so that's why you got Buckner and Pillow having this uh, kind of debate. And Buckner is the, the best general of this bunch, right? And he's going to be the one left holding the bag when it comes to the surrender. At this point, Floyd appears in between his two subordinates and then finally orders all the troops back into the defensive perimeter. Just then, Grant returns to the field, finally found by anxious couriers. He had ridden hard over icy roads to reach the scene of catastrophe. Grant is a brilliant horseman. Everybody who knew him, even from childhood, has said this about him. Brewing on his right flank, conferring with Generals McClernand and Wallace, Grant senses the crisis in the battle. Perhaps his own career has been reached. He sees McClernand's men standing in knots, talking excitedly with no officers giving directions. He also notices that the soldiers have their muskets but no ammunition, even though there's tons of it close at hand. Calling out to an aide to ride along the line with him, he shouts at the stunned troops, Fill your cartridge boxes quick and get into line. The enemy is trying to escape and he must not be permitted to do so. This works like a charm. Grant also discerns from prisoners what is happening on the Confederate line and that the victorious enemy might be just as demoralized as his own men. Yep. Whoever seizes the initiative at this point will achieve victory. Chomping down hard on an unlit cigar, he orders McClernand and Wallace simply, Gentlemen, the position on the right must be retaken. He also sends word to Foote requesting a show of force from the gunboats. Grant's quick and determined leadership helps spring his soldiers into action. In the and people say this all the time about Grant, that he was like just completely cool in crisis situations. And that's one of the most important aspects of Grant's character is that he in some ways was almost more focused and more effective when the situation was critical like this. They quickly stabilized their lines, pushing the Confederates back into their original defenses. The opportunity to escape was within reach of the Confederates, but now was lost to them. Yep, yeah, Forrest is like, I'm out of here. See ya.
Nearly 1,000 soldiers on both sides are dead, with about 3,000 wounded still lying across the field. Some freeze to death in the brutal snowstorm. At 1.30 a.m. on February 16th, the Confederate generals hold a council of war at the Dover Hotel. Here, the generals decide it is time to surrender the fort and its army. Brigadier General Floyd afraid that if captured, he would be indicted for corruption during his service as Secretary of War under President Buchanan. Quickly turns his command over to General Pillow. However, Pillow also fears reprisals from the North if he were to be captured. Yeah, Pillow's main thing though is that I'm too important to the Confederacy to end up in a Union prison camp. I have to get out of here for the sake of the country. But there's a reason why you don't hear Pillow's name much after this. And passes the command of Fort Donaldson over to Buckner, who agrees to remain behind and surrender the army. Disgusted at the general show of cowardice, Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest announces, I did not come here to surrender my command, and promptly storms out of the meeting. He proceeds to lead about 700 of his cavalrymen on their escape from the fort. They begin a long march through the snowstorm toward Nashville. Colonel Forrest will fight another day. U.S. Grant, unconditional surrender. And, and so what does that mean, unconditional surrender? That means there's no conditions. It means there's no agreement. So, for example, at, um, at Vicksburg, it's not an unconditional surrender. Uh, so there are certain conditions that are agreed to. So, for example, um, officers can keep their personal property, not slaves, but sidearms, horses, one horse each, things like that, uh, and that the men will not be sent to prison camps. They're going to be paroled, which means you basically sign a piece of paper that says, I promise not to fight until on paper I am exchanged with a Union soldier who has been captured and paroled. Um, it's all an honor system, but most people honored the parole. Um, but in this case, there's no conditions, right? It's just we surrender and we are at, we are, you know, at your mercy of whatever happens. General Buckner sends a message to General Grant asking for terms of surrender. Having helped Grant out of financial situations in his pre-war civilian life, Buckner was hoping that Grant would be merciful to the commander. It's now, funny how often this happens, right? Buckner and, and Grant knew each other. They were friends, and uh, they'll renew that friendship after the war. But yeah, I think they're in New York or something, and Grant's in a difficult situation financially. Buckner helps him out. He thinks, well, you know, Grant will be nice to me. But listen, Grant is a nice guy, but he's also uh, a good soldier. And he recognizes what the right thing to do is in this situation. Pemberton will do the same thing in Vicksburg, thinking, well, I'll surrender on the 4th of July because maybe I'll get better terms that way. Elver, the message he receives from Grant is that no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. He adds, I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner agrees to Grant's unconditional surrender. Fort Donaldson falls. I accept, I want to go back and read that, the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms which you propose, which are no terms at all. Works. Buckner agrees to Grant's unconditional surrender. Fort Donaldson falls that day, February 16th, and his army is marched off to northern prison camps. The decisive victory at the Battle of Fort Donaldson propels Ulysses S. Grant to national stardom, earning him the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant. So, cool aftermath of this, because many of you know that I'm actually working on a book on the 20th Ohio Infantry right now. It's kind of a Band of Brothers style book, where I'm gonna focus on like key soldiers and tell their stories while telling the, the greater narrative of what the 20th is doing. The 20th Ohio is one of just a couple of regiments who are detached from the army to escort these prisoners to union prison camps all over the place. And so like one company of the 20th Ohio goes with men to St. Louis to put them in prison camps. And one company goes up to Illinois and one company goes to Ohio to Camp Chase. And, and so this, this regiment is broken up into this, this prison detail where they're escorting huge numbers of Confederate soldiers. And in my doing my research, I found all these newspaper articles from states all over the North where, Hey, company I of the Ohio 20th Ohio arrived today with a thousand prisoners. And, uh, this unit of the 20th Ohio escorted 
the generals up to a prison camp in Boston, you know, stuff like that. Really fascinating stuff you don't really, really re read about too much in the history books. It also earns him the attention of President Lincoln. Close to a third of General Johnson's forces are now prisoners. Grant had captured more soldiers than all previous American generals combined, and Johnson was now deprived of more than 12,000 soldiers he would later need in the battles to come. Yep, big deal. With his decisive victory at Fort Donelson, Grant is promoted by President Lincoln to the rank of Major General and given command over the newly formed Army of the Tennessee. With Forts Henry and Donelson now fallen, Grant can now launch an invasion further south along the Tennessee. Yep. All right, so we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, a great book if you want to uh, follow it. I don't even know if you can get access to this now. I've had this book since I was a teenager. Time Life did a series back in the day uh, about the Civil War, and it was a bunch of books. And this one's The Road to Shiloh, and it covers all of the things like Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, Shiloh, Corinth, all of that. And, and I've been reading up on that as I prepare for my visit to Shiloh. But it's good stuff, and it's a, it's a great read if you want to learn more about that. You might be able to find it in the library somewhere. But definitely check out Warhawk. Check out my friend James Early's podcast on Great Battles of the Civil War. Um, in fact, I'll show you what it looks like so you know what you're talking about. So here it is on Audible. This is Key Battles of the American Civil War. And you can see just some of the stuff that he covered in this. There's one about the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, one about border states and the war in the West, um, Peninsula Campaign, Seven Days, Antietam, Fredericksburg, etc. Uh, so check that out. It's uh, definitely worth your time. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.